begin by saying what I'm very tempted to start with but won't talk about. So <laughs> Castle Ray uh, led me to think about uh, salon culture, Willem von Humboldt, Friedrich von Gens, and their ideas of what you should do to fulfill your human potential. That's a very intriguing discussion, but we can't go there. <laughs> so what I would like to offer, since I can't, you know, it's not the time for a substantial argument, um, is uh, uh, some reflections on where I think this kind of conference ex is extremely important, not just for practitioners, but also for the field of what I would broadly describe modern international history. Um, and that has a lot to do with uh, the fact that um, uh, let, me, let me start by saying where I come from. So I, uh, I'm currently work, working on a book on the transformation of the international order in what I call the long 20th century. Uh, for me, this 20th century starts in, around the 1860s. It ends around 1990. So what I'm interested in is the transformation of an international system that sort of eventually su uh, succeeds or transplants the Vienna system. Um, and I found uh, that the, in conceptually and in thinking about this, I'm more interested in discussing with historians of the 19th century than the 20th century. And you might guess already that one of them um, is Paul W. Schroeder. Um, so I would like to come back uh, to his work and, and offer um, just a perspective that I think a lot of the, the papers reminded me of something I would call Paul W. Schroeder plus. Yeah, so there's a basis of a discussion, and we are branching out. We're becoming more global, but conceptually, I haven't heard much that would convince me that he hasn't already done an awful lot of work. On the global side, I find myself uh, being very, um, uh, let's say, stimulated by engaging with the work of Jürgen Osterhammel. It was mentioned here as well. So he has written a book called Again, transformation will appear in my remarks quite often. So he has written a book called The Transformation of the World, very limited title, uh, in the long 19th century. Uh, that has just been translated also into English. It's another quite a tome. So he offers a very sophisticated engagement with Paul W. Schroeder and the whole idea that, of course, you have to understand the particular European nature of the Vienna system, but you also have to understand its global implications. He, for example, talks of spheres of order in the world that emerge because the Vienna system works as it does. Eventually, um, towards the end of my remarks, I want to tell you what I think that has to do, you know, what the Vienna system has to do with the rise of the United States and the whole idea that we have a more American-dominated international system in the 20th century. And I would argue that it has an awful lot to do with that, um, and I'll come to that. So um, the first remark then would be, um, I found very noticeable that We've talked a little bit about the balance of power, but the idea that the b main interest in discussing the Congress of Vienna uh, should be to think, was this a wonderful, timeless application of the laws of the balance of power, of statesmen who understood that and manipulated that, yeah? that that is really for historians not so much the interesting question anymore. So we've heard a lot about learning processes, changes in the norms, changes in ideas in political culture. Yeah, this is, I think, a very um, uh, positive trend, and I would argue that is something Paul, Schro Paul W. Schroeder would absolutely welcome. This is what he talks about. Yeah? But he has had le less space in his short 900-page book to deal with a lot of the empirical yeah, going into, sort of into depth on policing action in the Netherlands and many other issues that were very, I think, gainfully um, highlighted here by um, Professor de Graaf and others. So fundamentally, I would say the idea that this is a balance of power, timeless yeah, predicament that statesmen can learn from, that the young Kissinger would have argued, is something intellectually I don't find interesting anymore. What I do find interesting um, is to use the Congress of Vienna to come to another sort of issue in international history as we see it. I call it in brief the obsession with moments the obsession with moments in international or global history that we study yeah, and that are so evo evoked so often. So was 1814-15 a moment of this kind, a transformative moment? Um, in the 20th century, we have, you know, we'd think of the Wilsonian moment, the moment of 1919. Partly, this is a, a result of, you know, if you want to do global history, yeah, and you don't have 10 years to write your book. Yeah, you're looking for something that covers the world, but you find a way to make it a moment so, you can, so it's manageable. The problem is if you don't understand how to place this in a wider context where you look at long-term systemic 
changes and ideas, then you don't understand the moment, you will overemphasize it, and it will be quite distortive. This is a problem I see in international history. So I do find that by looking at how far the Vienna system was really a transformative phase, of course we have to understand what was transformed and what was it transformed towards. And I still, I'm sorry, think that Paul Schroeder's uh, analysis of what the 18th century system was like and what changed qualitatively in Europe with standards of international law, standards especially of something that I haven't heard much about, international politics, the political, the political culture. Yeah, that is not just a question of treaties or international legal norms, it's the sort of, it's the political ground rules. Who sets these ground rules? Yeah, why is it that a very superior power like the British Empire or Russia agree to more common ground rules, although they could have acted in a much more unilateral fashion? Here I do find Schroeder's basic argument very convincing, yeah? And of course we have to look at the moment or this phase of 1814-15 in a wider scope. Yeah? And I think this is an approach where the 19th century and Osterhammel's work, taking this up in a global sphere, can teach us a lot for understanding the 20th century. Yeah? So this is, I think, uh, the engagement. And I find, maybe I'm wrong, but my impression is that a lot of the papers here actually engage with these sorts of debates. And some of, I, I would just argue that if you read Osterhammel, it's a long book, a lot of questions that have been asked here have already been answered. <laughs> he has already worked a lot on, on many of these aspects. Um, now, this brings me briefly to uh, a, a short contrast. So we had the contrast 1814-15 and 1919, Wilson, yeah, and the uh, Versailles process. This is what I write about, so I try to be extra brief. We heard yesterday, so of course, Wilson was very disparaging. Yeah, so the Congress of Vienna, this is something we have to overcome, yeah, all of that. It's of course, you know, it's a statement of a very provincial politician who has no experience in international diplomacy, who looks for ways to, uh, to um, emphasize that he has new answers, but he does not have, yeah? So he, he contrasts, this is an old American tradition, he contrasts this with something that went before. Um, but if you then look a bit further, what does Wilson do once he really has to think about what kind of League of Nations he wants to create? He, he talks about an international concert, an international concert of right, of the power that shall henceforth set new terms for the, for the earth. Who in the end is in this concert? Is it a very egalitarian, yeah, internationalist construction? No, there's a league council. He talks about special responsibilities for powers, you know, just by accident. Uh, mm -hmm. The United States, Britain, France in particular. He has to make all kinds of negotiations. So even Wilson is a very problematic candidate. Yeah? His rhetoric, yes, but in terms of the substance, he is much clearer. He faces similar issues in a much more complex environment in around 1918 that the peacemakers yeah, or security orderers of 1814-15 also faced. Um, this leads me to the uh, sort of, just as, as an aside, another architect of the League of Nations is Lord Robert Cecil. Yeah, and so for Robert, Lord Robert Cecil, if you look at the papers and the private memoranda and other memoranda, he looks at the Congress of Vienna and the European concert as a model for now constructing a kind of what he calls an Atlantic concert, possibly a global concert, a very hierarchical structure yeah, where especially the Anglo-American powers for reasons of being more civilized as they had amply proved in the 19th century, yeah, should now work as the kind of steering powers of this concert. Yeah, so to, to argue that in 1919, the 1814 had such a bad reputation is distortive, is, mis is misleading. So finally, um, why, why not discuss a question? We are here in the United States and in New York, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so what does Vienna have to do with the United States, the, the fact that we can sit here as we do? And I would, this is a, something that I've discussed and that builds on Paul W. Schroeder, so I, I, ju I just try to convey this, um, in his, so a classic argument would be that it's under the shield of the British Royal Navy uh, that the United States can issue a Monroe Doctrine that it could never have you know, defended against superior European powers, and so it's British supremacy that shields the United States. Eventually it becomes uh, a world power after 1860 when states become really different animals, also states within empires. But um, I would argue it's because of European powers paying attention and respecting international norms and restraint, including the powers of the Holy Alliance, that 
you do not see a scenario that we could have seen, namely a kind of revitalization of imperial competition in the Western Hemisphere and in North America, which the United States, which you know, was the rogue nation of that era, a, a nation that you know, where lots of elites spouted about liberal principles, but acted in the most ruthless, expansionist fashion, yeah? conquering North America. We know, I mean, this is, I don't have to go into the details. So who paid attention to norms and international, uh, um, I, sort of ideas of internationalism? Not those who were spouting them. Yeah? Words and deeds is a, is a I think uh, Thucydides introduced it, and I think it's still a very important concept. So uh, I, what I heard in many papers here, and just as a final point, is that while it seems more conservative, if you th just take the, the litmus test, who not, didn't just talk about norms of international law, but actually acted in accordance with them, and you compare the constellation of 1814-15 with what was said in 1919 and how it, well, how it was acted upon, then the Congress of Vienna is, uh, comes across as a much more forward-looking, hierarchically internationalist settlement and the one more complex in the 20th century as a very, very unfinished, uneven, double standard piece, yeah, despite all the rhetoric. So I stop here. Thank you. I am not now, nor have I ever been, an historian.